This is the new ProCS version of my open source response time tool. I've been working on this for months and I'm incredibly excited to finally show it off properly. I should explain why this exists though, and the first clue is in the name, CS. That stands for chip shortage, and this whole thing is designed to solve two or actually probably three big problems. The first is the part that hasn't changed since I started making these tools. The original open source response time tool had a soldered in Adafruit Itsy Bitsy M4, and OSRTT Pro had the same board but on removable headers instead. As a part choice, it made perfect sense. It fitted all of the project's needs, it was widely available, and at a reasonable price too. Sadly, over time, those latter two points changed. Mauser, the place that I get all of my components from, at least for the most part, stopped selling them, and I had to look elsewhere. The price also increased too. Now, I just ate that cost. I didn't want to raise the price of these tools just because the parts were getting more expensive, but in recent months, they've become completely unavailable, at least to sole traders like me. The last three boards that I bought to round out the last batch of OSRTT Pro boards came from an eBay seller in Germany for double the price I was paying when I started building these tools. That's just not sustainable, and the stock levels were pretty low there too. So I did the professional thing and built the microcontroller onto my board. I followed Adafruit's schematic and wired it up as they have it, and that's important because one of the key things about the Sandy 51, the chip that both I and Adafruit use, is that it requires what's called a bootloader. A bootloader is, you can think of it kind of like the BIOS or maybe even the operating system that the chip runs with. Specifically, it sets things up to like what all the configurable pins do. It sets up all the clocks and internal registers and provides the instructions that then lets you run whatever user space program you install. In my case, that's the OSRTT code. While I did briefly consider writing my own bootloader, and I have spent far, far too much time reading the datasheet for this damn chip, Adafruit has done such an incredible job writing a brilliantly reliable and feature-rich solution that I'd be reinventing the wheel with a flat plate. It just didn't make sense, so I'm using the Itsy Bitsy bootloader in here. The second problem the new CS boards solve is trouble with manufacturing and reliability. In the last two batches of OSRTT Pro boards that I've built, I've had a painfully high defect rate, specifically the custom digital potentiometer that I designed to make or sort of control the gain of the light sensor. This is made up of eight resistors in increasing sizes and a switch chip that effectively bypasses any combination of those resistors, allowing for the functional resistance to be modulated from around 1 kilo ohm to 1.3 mega ohms. That means no matter the display's brightness, OSRTT Pro should be able to measure it. As a bit of a background for why I designed my own digital potentiometer instead of using a stock one, well, there were two main problems there. The first was that the largest digital potentiometers were only rated for around 1 mega ohms, and that just wasn't quite enough. Second, and the more prominent issue really, was that after I acquired some of those pretty rare 1 mega ohm digital pods, I realized that they have an insane tolerance. The one that I tested measured at just 750 kilo ohms, and the actual rated tolerance was a shocking plus or minus 30%. That would mean that each OSRTD Pro would have potentially swung by 60% in the resistor values, and that just wasn't acceptable. So I designed my own solution. Originally, I was using this Max 14662 chip, which was an eight channel switch that talked to the microcontroller over three wire SPI. That was fine, although I had trouble soldering it down. See, I've been building these boards 
by hand at my desk downstairs. I don't have a pick and place machine or soldering ovens, I have my shaky hands and a soldering iron and heat gun. So to solder this tiny chip was a pain. I decided to switch to a very similar chip, this time from Analog Devices and ADG714, which had a much easier to solder pinout. This worked fine for several batches, with only the very first test board that I had soldered and desoldered several times, uh, and also the most, uh, the two most recent batches having problems, uh, sort of started to have those issues. Instead of the potent potentiometer gradually decreasing the resistance, it was just all over the place. This legitimately took me a month to fully diagnose, and genuinely had me in utter despair, not knowing why it was suddenly broken. While even now I'm not 100% sure, I'm pretty convinced that it's the PCBs themselves that are at fault, and specifically the footprint of the ADG714. Maybe the pads are just a bit too close, and especially after heating, especially uh, from the bottom rather than just the heat gun on the top, they started to warp slightly or otherwise sort of short and deform to the point that they were basically foobar. Either way, it turns out that that happened on the newer design of boards too that still use the same chip but on the new design, so I had to redesign that part. Now, there aren't really many 8-way switch ICs on the market, at least not in the 8 single pole single throw style switch that I need here. I've basically used the only two options I have available. Now I could go back to the Max 14662, uh, but that really sucks to wire up, and for all I know could be susceptible to the same PCP issue, so I opted to go a new route. An analog route. Instead of using one digital 8-way switch chip, I'm now using two analog 4-way switch chips. It does take up a bit more room on the board, and requires 8 pins for the microcontroller to control it, but luckily there are just enough pins available, and this should be a much more reliable way to control the resistance. There's also a slight advantage to using surface mount resistors rather than the through-hole ones I was using, both in accuracy and in ease of manufacturing. That actually brings me on to the other big win here, which is that I'm now getting these boards manufactured. Not completely built, I'm still hand soldering the headers for the display and the button at the top, but all of the surface mount parts are being pre-fitted to the board before they arrive to me. This is the only way that I can get the microcontroller soldered reliably, and it takes a load off of me so I can spend more time, well, not breathing in soldering fumes or ruining my already ruined back. To be clear though, every unit is still assembled, obviously a bit of hand soldering, tested and validated before shipping, uh, and you know, having them pre-soldered really only makes that more reliable. One thing that I put a lot of effort into ensuring was that this new CS version doesn't need a different firmware file than the regular Pro. That's good both for me, as I don't need to manage even more copies of ostensibly the same code, and it's good for owners of these tools, because it means that any new features, fixes, or any other improvements I may get up to will instantly work on the standard Pro boards just as they would on the new newer CS version. That also means that there can't be any mix-up between which firmware file is needed, a mistake that I learned from the jump between the OG version and the Pro Tools, and one that I don't want to make again. The new CS boards have one of their uh, last remaining digital pins tied high via a resistor, meaning that they should never mistake themselves between the standard Pro and the new CS version. Although, just in case they do, there's no damage done. The final challenge these help with is an issue I've discovered in collaboration with a number of the owners of OSRTT Pro Tools, especially Dominic from KitGuru, who has helped an awful lot in providing data and running tests to help find this issue. 
Basically, in some fairly rare situations, thanks to gamma curves, where down at RGB 0 to around 51, there's just very little light level difference, OSRTT Pro often struggles to capture any meaningful light level difference, especially in the gamma table. If you're using the stock RGB5 tolerance, but the program can barely tell the difference between RGB0 and 51, well, it isn't going to be able to find what value RGB5 is. Now, to be clear, this can generally be fixed by using a steeper gamma curve as in a lower number. So instead of, say, gamma 2.2, which is often default, try using 1.8. However, since I'm planning on re I was planning on redesigning the tool anyway, I took this opportunity to not only improve the gain function, but the light sensor in general. I did an awful lot of testing with different configurations, even MacGyvering this, uh, well, rather interesting contraption to be able to test a higher number of photodiodes than I had originally designed. The biggest revelation came by mistake, really. See, I've been using Osram uh, BPW34S photodiodes, specifically uh, five of them on the bottom of the board, and they work fine. But when it comes to manufacturing boards, single-sided manufacturing works an awful lot better. And since I've already moved to reverse mount photodiodes for the latency tool, I decided to swap to them here too. I picked up what I thought was going to be the same thing from the manufacturer's you know, uh, selection of, of parts, and I didn't think that much about it. Then the parts arrived, and besides finding that they had the same issue uh, with the switch chip, I also found that the photodiode set was, like, considerably more sensitive. It turns out that the version of the BPW34S that Vache makes, the V BPW34S, or SR for reverse in my case, is considerably more sensitive. Like, 20 to 30% more sensitive, yet just as linear, and with plenty of high-end or top-end as well. Long story short, I ended up redesigning the resistor array for, to, to better account for this higher current output, and included an extra photodiode for a total of six now. That means that even on an OLED, and even on Gamma 2.6, you can actually get some difference in the data that OSRTT detects. Now, I would still recommend using the most linear gamma possible for the best results, but the aim of the pro line in general is to make or to be able to test at whatever end users would actually be using. And so I thought it was worth putting in the extra effort to make that sort of meet this goal as best as possible. I do also want to make a quick note on the price of the Pro CS model, as it's now £235. That has actually only increased relative to inflation and helps me keep making tools like this and supports the development of the software and firmware that these tools use. Also, it's USB-C now. So, if all of that sounds interesting, OSRTT Pro CS is up on OSRTT.com, either outright available, depending on when you watch this, or available for pre-order. So do go take a look if you're interested. Otherwise, that is pretty much it for this video. Uh, if you are interested in the project, you can obviously head over to the GitHub repo where all of this stuff is open source, both the firmware and things like the schematics for this are all there, or at least they should be. If they're not, pester me on Discord, because I forget sometimes. Anyway, other than that, thank you very much for watching. If you want to see more videos like this one, more actual tech reviews as well, hit the subscribe button, turn the bell notification icon, check out plenty of other videos in the end cards, including more about the project itself, if you want to learn more. And yeah, otherwise, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you all in the next video.